and it is a deep privilege and an honor to present to you Mr. James Baldwin. I'm very proud to be here tonight, and before I say anything at all, I want to say that I'm very proud of all those marvelous people who preceded me. I mean, the choir, and um, and those actors, and a whole lot of other people who are mainly invisible. But uh, I love them all. Now, I'm going to try to, um, I'm going to try to be as honest as I can. And um, I'm going to ask you to bear with me and let's try to make a certain journey together. We know in what context we're all here and for what reason. In our various ways we know what terrible trouble we are in. But let us pretend for the moment that it is possible to drop out of the mind labels and slogans. Let us pretend that we can get beneath and beyond the phrase civil rights to what we are really concerned with. Let us consider a life, a life, which begins in fluid and in darkness Everybody's life begins there. And according to mysteries which we do not understand, is nourished for a certain amount of time and then abruptly hits the terrifying air. This life opens its eyes not really on the world, but on its mother and its father, which it is compelled to trust since it is helpless. Through its mother and its father, it begins to discover such details as oranges, Such details as hunger, such details as panic, such details as loneliness, by and by this life realizes that in fact it is trapped between a silent heaven and an extremely bloody earth. and has somehow, in order to maintain itself, begin to define the world around it. That world has already, in some, some sense, been defined by what his mother and his father believe, and what his mother and father have told him, and what his mother and father endure. The child knows, for example, before he knows he knows it, and long before he can say it. What has happened to his father 
at work that day. The child knows, and he doesn't tell his mother or his father that he knows, when his father is ashamed of himself. The child knows why his mother looks that way on payday and knows what those strangers, sometimes called welfare workers, sometimes called teachers, sometimes called cops, are doing in his house what they are doing to his mother and his father and what they are doing to him. Now a child's technique is silence. I mean, I know the children rant and rave and scream and throw tantrums, but essentially his technique is silence. When he's really discovering something, when he is really hurt, when it really matters, you got to coax it out of the child. If you love the child, if you're not too ashamed of yourself, and if you have the time. Now the child we're considering is every child, every life, but This particular child is also, let us say, at this moment, a black child. And one of the things that is happening to him, though he does not know it, and cannot say it, is that the world in which he finds himself, and in which he is trying to become defined, and which he is trying to control by naming things, that is all the word now means, one tries to control the life around you by telling, by telling yourself what it is. So if you know that it's an apple or a chair, you think you know something about it. It's better than having no name at all. This child in this republic looks around him one fine day and discovers no reflection of himself whatever as far as the world in which he finds himself is concerned, he does not exist. He is not to be found in the books, except with a no, uh, bone between his nose. He is not to be found until this very moment in any history of America. He is not to be found on the stage, insofar as we have one, he is not to be found in the movies, unless he's afraid of ghosts. <laughs> he is not to be found on television, unless he's pretty pale. <laughs> now, this is no stage joke, I'm telling you. You must consider what happens to a life which finds no mirror. You must ask yourself about your own life and how and by what means did you arrive at whatever identity you now think you have. And ask yourself whether or not it is true that we, all of us, take our estimate of ourselves from the eyes of other people so that love becomes a very serious matter. It is by no means a mystical statement to say that love is all that can save you. I know that in this country and in this age, these sound like the ravings of a madman. 
But in fact, if you check it out yourself, try to deal with this life I've been trying to convey to you very, very sketchily. By the time it is 16, and is already turned away from any belief in other human beings, any trust at all, ask yourself why this life so soon is putting down the world, carrying knives and guns, and what yeoman labor one has got to be willing to do to reach this human being. My point is, one of my points is, that when a society does this, to a sufficient degree, the society is committing suicide. If you'll bear with me another minute, I will ask you to consider, I'm asking you to consider in your own lives. This is not an abstraction. At the moment, this is not even a civil rights rally. Consider what happens to the unloved. Consider what would have happened to you. When the chips are down, and we find ourselves without all these masks and all these clothes and all these pretensions and all these attitudes down there in the dark where everybody lives. And whatever got you out of it, if you got out of it. If this proposition or if this suspicion is correct, that is, if I am right in assuming that those who are unloved cannot live and cannot grow. Let us, by that tentative light, consider the state of this nation. I am not very old, and I have not seen very much, but I have seen one thing. On the block that I was born, which is still there, where most of us perished, there was one great difference, just the same, between that sordid block in Harlem and the rest of New York City, to say nothing of the country. And the difference may sound mystical, but it was this. If a girl had a baby and she wasn't married, she wasn't stoned to death, and we took care of the baby. The morals didn't matter, especially the morals of this country which doesn't believe in them and doesn't live by them. But she mattered, the girl mattered, and the baby mattered. It is intolerable to me to imagine for one moment that I would exchange that standard for the standards of this republic. It is inconceivable that anyone who wanted to live would try to live the way most white Americans live. This is, and I am speaking as a part of the country, and a country which I love, or I would not be here. Of all the places I have ever been, of all the things that I've ever seen, this country is in so many ways the most despairing and above all, the most unloved. I don't mean unloved by other people. I'm not talking about Vietnam. I'm talking about the people who live in it, who do not love it enough to take care of it. <laughs> you
You have to have a cataclysm in New York for people to speak to each other. And if there's anything rarer than real friendship between Americans, I would have a hard time naming it. Now, I know this sounds excessive, and I know you are thinking he is putting me on. But believe me, if we were, as I hope one day we will be, a civilized nation, name only one event, because there are so many, the acquittal of those people in Mississippi whom the entire world knows to be guilty. That farce, that impertinence, that obscenity should have sent millions of Americans into the streets. By what right? Does the governor of that state and its principal representative and J. Edgar Hoover, by what right do they insult us in so intolerable a way? And what is the wrong with this sovereign people who allow the government to say we can do nothing about it? It is late in the day for a country in which I have bled and died for nearly 400 years, in which I have been maligned perpetually until this very moment. A marvelous question, what does the Negro want? It is late in the day for this country to pretend that I am not a part of it, and it is entirely indefensible that the government which can make me pay my taxes and put me in the army and say the Vietnamese, say nothing of the Cubans, can be with a straight face tell me later. Those men in Mississippi, and I'm speaking only of one event, kill three human beings. They kill them for nothing. For nothing. With our sanction and in our name. No one can tell me that we can do nothing about it. We've let chaos ride unchecked here. We made ignorance and youth the only virtues. It is a great American crime to be complex or double-minded in fact, it is a great American crime to have any aspirations toward growing up. And with this peculiar arsenal that is our virtue, our ignorance, and our youth, we pretend to be able to conquer the world Mexican kids of 10 already know far more about life than Eisenhower ever learned.
I realized one thing. Well, I realized a few things, but I realized above all one thing. When I was living in Europe, which parenthetically I may say, I was driven to because I could not live here. I realized that the French and the English even, God bless them, <laughs> and the Italians and the Spanish, the people with whom I dealt, the Algerians and the Africans, they didn't dislike Americans on sight. They were perfectly willing to deal with them man to man. But there was one fatal difficulty. They couldn't find the man. <laughs> and I realized that those jokers wandering around Europe in their innocence, and there's something beautiful about it, you know, but it has to end. They were resented not because they were cruel, not because they couldn't speak the language, not even because they made the extraordinary assumption that if you spoke louder, everyone would understand you. <laughs> they began to be hated for a very simple reason. And we haven't learned it yet. They began to be hated because they did not know they had no way of knowing that what they were facing was a man like them. They had no way of knowing this cat also bled. They had no way of knowing that the man they were talking to, the woman they were talking to, was a human being. She was not simply like a whore. He was not simply like a bum. He was not simply like a writer. She wasn't simply just an actress. They had a long tale to tell. And the Americans couldn't hear it, couldn't see it, didn't know it. Above all, didn't know it. And what they didn't know about them what we, the Americans, don't know about the world, I suddenly realized is what Americans don't know about me. We have paid, and we are paying. I think probably the most terrifying price in history for pretending that a man is not a man. Because by now, by now, really, the entire country believes it. They really don't know why Negroes go to jail. They really don't know why they lay down on airports and tie themselves to cranes. They don't know that I'm not trying to get into a white neighborhood. I'm only trying to live. But they don't know that. It'll be one thing, really, if they knew it and denied it. We've been now so brainwashed. It demands so much nervous energy in the loins, in the heart, in the guts to shake a Negro's hand. <laughs> one, I really, literally have been through this. You, they walk away mopping their brows. <laughs> wow! And then they want a medal. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is sad, ladies and gentlemen, this is sad. It is not the Negro in this country. There are not many of us here, really, you know. We're roughly one-tenth of the nation. We have suffered a long time. We bled a long, long time. Some cat in the Congo, you know, said, I think I'm quoting right, too. We are, we are now very upset about the massacre in the Congo, all of a sudden. 
I think I'm quoting him right. He said, blood gushing from a heart you love. Have you ever seen that? And I thought, and I think I'm a pretty good Christian. I thought, are you kidding? <laughs> blood gushing from a heart I loved. Are you just finding out what that feels like? We've endured it a very long time. A very long time. We have paid our dues. Ladies and gentlemen, we have paid our dues. It is not we. I want to make this very clear. As clear as I can. And do remember we're talking about a life. And remember that I said, and before I repudiate the standards by which I grew up, which meant that the baby and the mother were more important than the morals, and live by the standards of this country, I would rather die. It is not we, the American Negro, who is to be saved here. It is you, the American Republic, and you ain't got much time. Thank you. James Baldwin. Mr. Baldwin, the first question is, why did you leave Paris? Very <coughs> I shall holler. Uh, the first question, is why did you leave Paris? I suppose the assumption is if it's so great, why didn't you stay? Well, I said I was going to try to be as honest as I could. I left Paris in 57, and I came home to stay. And I've been home twice before. And each time it was pretty disheartening, so I, I went back. I came home in July 57 because I was, I found it intolerable to find myself described in another language by Frenchmen who thought they were describing Algerians. <laughs> you know that they steal, they're dirty, they are rapists and they carry knives. And I, was supposed to agree with this because I was civilized, unlike the Algerians. I got tired of dealing with that and I got tired of trying to explain what was happening in America to Africans and Algerians and Frenchmen and all over Europe. And I thought, in any case, I was, in any case, I thought, no, 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 I, I can't make this scene, I, I, so I'll split and I'll go home and see what's happening. No. <laughs> and that's what I did and I've been here ever since. You sound so bitter towards the white man. What about the white man who is sympathetic and enthusiastic and willing to fight for the civil rights cause? <coughs> we'll try it one more time. I am not. Repeat. I am not bitter against the white man. I got too much, I got really too much in my mind and too, too many other things to do. You, you flatter yourself. <laughs> I'm talking about a state of mind and a state in the heart which allows you to commit the crimes you committed and then pretend you didn't commit them. I'm talking about what it does to you what it's done to me has already been done. I'm talking about what it does to you. It is not my problem, it is your problem. As for sympathetic to the cause, etc., etc., what cause? I don't want any more missionaries. I barely survived the first load. I mean that. What 
What Road for the Black Man? Martin Luther King, Nonviolent Philosophy, Malcolm X, Nationalist Approach, Elijah Muhammad, Black Muslim. Wait a minute. <laughs> Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad. Well, I'm afraid all three of those roads are closed. For example, not every Negro, this may be an astounding thing to hear, not every Negro goes to church. <laughs> to leave it only at that. As a Malcolm, let me do this another way, because I, let, me get, let me get beneath the question. The question is essentially, essentially this. I put it in two parts. If it's a white man asking the question, the question is essentially, are you going to do to us what we did to you? That's, what, that's what's beneath that question. And the only, only honest answer I can give you is that in this country, it's extremely improbable. <laughs> I can't say much about the world. But that's beneath the question, if a white man asked it. And the answer to that is that I don't know. I wouldn't like to see that happen. But a great deal of what's going to happen does not depend on me, but on what we will now call the white power structure. What is going to happen depends on what we will now call the white system of reality. What will happen depends on whether or not the Western nations and all the white people in this country are descendants of Europe, whether or not the West can face and transcend its own history. Concretely, whether or not the Western nations, that is say France, is able to understand that the history of France written by Frenchmen is one history, but there was another one being written all the time with which they must now deal, written in all those colonies. That is also the history of France. If France can't face that, there'll be no France. And this is true for England, and this is true for us. But if a black man asks that question, it refers then to something else. And it's a very frightening question. Because we, the American Negro, unlike the African, don't have, to put it as crudely as it can be put, in the state we just passed the Proposition 14, any real estate. In Johannesburg, where, by the way, people are being slaughtered as we stand here, and it is not in the newspapers, one fine day the tide will turn and it will be in the newspapers, and then suddenly you will care, and expect me to believe that you care. In Johannesburg, at least they know one thing. It's a very simple problem. And sooner or later they will win and get back the land. This is not the situation of the American Negro who cannot do that because he is allied with, involved with, part of, married to, descendant of, locked together with his oppressor. Either we can make it together, or none of us will make it. That's a very different problem. And we have worked, that is to say, we have watched. Hmm? The strategy of nonviolence has not, after all, did not save those three kids in Mississippi, for example. It is not, and people have been getting their heads with it for a long time, it hasn't done what we thought it would do. We do begin to suspect that it might have been an error to mount an attack on the consciences of people who on the evidence have no consciences. 
It's a very serious matter to decide what to tell your child. Because he wasn't born in Islam. He doesn't go to church. And there's no help on the basis of the evidence forthcoming from the American government or the American people. If one assumed that by bombing a few bridges or blowing off a few heads, one could do it, without destroying an entire generation, and maybe one would do that, but you can't do that. So I don't know where we go from here. I really don't know. Nobody really knows. But I do know that neither Malcolm, nor Elijah, nor Martin, nor I, nor anybody else has yet figured out how, in the next five minutes, to bring this kindergarten nation to a level on which it can be spoken to. That's the real problem. If we can achieve that, then there's some hope. But at the moment, the American people don't even know they have a problem. So I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> Jimmy, since you touched on this problem of nonviolence, here are two questions that are closely linked together. Is there any answer to the racial problem without violence? Do you believe there is a peaceable, and that's what I'm reading, solution to our race problems in the U.S.? That refers back to what we were saying before. That doesn't depend on Martin or me or the Negro population. That depends on whether or not we'll ever get an, a responsible American citizenry. I don't know. I would love to see a peaceable solution as long as it doesn't mean I have to stay down on the levee. Because <laughs> I ain't gonna stay there. Let's get, let's get that straight. I mean, the days when the nigger was in its place are gone. I ain't coming back no more. Whether or not it's peaceful does not depend on us. If there isn't much time, as you say, can America make the necessary transformation by itself? <laughs> oh, ask me. I'll ask you. <laughs> by itself? I guess they mean this nation, can they do it without uh, the influence of other cultures or other peoples, I suppose? Well, I don't know how to answer that, really, because I don't quite know what the question means. Um, are you talking in terms of military allies? I don't... I really don't... The transition, in any case, has got to be made. And America... Uh, it's going to be made whether America does it or not. We will do it, or it will be done for us. And the key to that is, it seems to me, to this transition, is an examination of the economy, which you may be surprised to learn is one of the most preposterous and iniquitous economies on the face of the earth. And furthermore, an economy which no one else can use, not having any sources of cheap labor. This means that if one is serious about this transition, one has got to investigate why our cities are in the hands of land speculators, for example, because they are. And why so many mediocre and really worthless people have so much power in a sovereign nation. What I'm saying is the transition will not be painless. And it has not even yet begun. We are on the edge of social chaos. And really everybody knows it. But no one is willing to do anything about it. Uh, from the floor. I did not get a card to ask a question. <laughs> All right, give him, give him a half a dozen cards over there, will you? Uh, what is the role of the Negro Church? Is the Negro Church still the most influential institution among Negroes? No. <laughs> <laughs> Would a situation similar to that in Harlem as relating to the violent demonstration occur in, in the ghettos of Los Angeles, you think? When did you discover you have ghettos in Los Angeles? <laughs> <laughs> that's marvelous. <laughs> and that's a one-word answer too, yes. I'll tell you something else. We talk about Mississippi and Alabama. 
New York, California. I will tell you what a veteran of the Mississippi, Mississippi Work Farms told me, and he was right. He said it's the same plantation all over the United States. How does the progress of the American Negro compare with the progress of other minorities in their search for equality and recognition in the history of mankind? <laughs> I think, I think. <laughs> Can I say it? Somebody's putting me on. <laughs> How does it differ? What is the question? Come here, come here. Well, the country was settled, as I know you know, by minorities. There is one distinction between myself and an Irishman. Guess what that is? Listen, it is late in the day to be asking the, those dreary questions. <laughs> it is not one of those um, escalating things, you know, like I get here, then you get here, and then he gets here, and then he gets here, and by and by we all make it up in uh, Radio City. It ain't like that at all. <laughs> not at all. If you're white, and I haven't yet mastered English. You can, get, you can get off the boat on Friday. And on Tuesday, I am working for you. <laughs> Let's not kid ourselves. This is not a minority problem. The problem is I was a slave here once and everybody can see it. It is written on my brow. That's how it compares. You say nothing of. The other, rather more terrifying question, which is, what exactly did happen to everybody else who got here? Where are you? Here's one that will get you some votes among the liberals. Uh, what do you think about the free speech movement? <laughs> What do I think about the free speech movement? I think it's a scandal that one has to have a free speech movement in a country which prides itself on free speech. <laughs> and furthermore, I think it is a scandal that we allow policemen and illiterate law enforcement officers to tell us what to think, what to read, what to paint, and what to do. I'm talking about Jacob Hoover and all those other cops who don't, wouldn't know a book if it hit him on the head. <laughs> By what right and in whose name do they walk in and take books off bookshelves? Huh? Free speech indeed. Go on. This is about the middle class Negro. Don't you, do you think the middle class Negro <laughs> Do you think the middle class Negro is more middle class than Negro? <laughs> well, I can't play with the question. I have to say, let's let me take it seriously. Yes, of course he is. You know, there's no reason to suppose, to suppose an American Negro born in this society wouldn't also try to make his Cadillac, you know, and get his real estate, get some change together. Of course. <laughs> and of course, you know, he would begin to despise all the funky brothers who ain't got it. Mm? Naturally. That's all right. The Negro middle class is in some trouble, and the trouble is this. It doesn't have any utility anymore for Mr. Charlie. Huh? There was a time when the American middle class did have a, make a pretense at least of 
representing the people in the streets. But that time is gone. It is long gone. I beg, you know, if we're going to define the role of the American middle class, and I don't want to name no names, particularly. <laughs> but we do know, we do know of a few Negro millionaires who may, who, whom I don't know by name, whom I don't know personally, so I'm not talking about the people themselves. Nevertheless, we do know that one of them, because he had the most, he had the only motel which Negroes could stay, got bombed three times. Now you know, that does do something to a cat's thinking. He did, he'd been a good boy, too, you know. <laughs> I can afford to ask this question because the gentleman I speak of is in India. Uh, Police Chief Parker says, quote, Negroes in LA don't participate in demonstrations. Is it because they don't want integration or are they waiting? <laughs> you have to repeat that. Please. I'm sorry. Police Chief Parker says, quote, Negroes in LA don't participate in demonstrations. And the question oh, is, mm -hmm. is it because they don't want integration or are they waiting? Well, that's an easy question. They're waiting. They're waiting. <laughs> They're waiting. Now, we're all kind of waiting. We don't quite know what we're going to do from here, you know. And as for integration, let's get this clear, too. No one in this late date is fighting for integration. The problem is that we are already integrated. We would, it was done with clubs and knives and guns. We know how that was done. We've been integrated a long time. I know it. You don't face it, but I know it. <laughs> what we are fighting for is something else. The legal or the technical term is desegregation. That means, let me out of jail. I'll take it from there. <laughs> maybe I live next door to you and maybe I won't. <laughs> Leave it up to me. That's what it means. Leave it up to me. But as for integration, ladies and gentlemen, you put me next, I'm a very dark cat. Put me next to an African and see what happened to my grandmother. Think about it. In Africa, you would be colored. In Africa, I am suspect. <laughs> And this is the last question. Mr. Baldwin, why do you alienate and insult your white audience by saying flatly, quote, they don't understand? Many of us have given the civil rights cause considerable support and don't deserve to be completely rejected. <laughs> well, let us put it this way. My white audience, as, is, as it is so quaintly put, <laughs> did not create me. They didn't pay my dues for me. I will not allow my white audience to be flattered because I lived. And I'm not asking for your sympathy. I'm asking you to grow up, which is a very different matter. I'm a shoe shine boy. I can still shine shoes. And I can afford to alienate my white audience if that is what you call it because I wasn't aiming at that. The assumption behind the question is that I should be polite because you read my books. <laughs> well, the books themselves are not very polite. <laughs> now let us get this straight. Let me try it one more time. It is not my problem. It is not the Negro problem. It isn't. <laughs> it is your problem.
Thank you.